why would women be getting surgery on a part of their body that so few people see, like compared to say a nose job or a boob job where the results are so visible? And that's that's what inspired me to, to get into the genital body image field first. And in fact, labiaplasty is still the fastest growing cosmetic surgery type in the world. So it really hasn't slowed down. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. I have a fantastic episode for you coming up with Dr. Gemma Sharp, who is a research fellow at the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre, and she leads the body image research group there. She holds a bachelor's degree in molecular biology, a bachelor of science honours degree in microbiology and immunology, immunology, a master's degree in oncology from the University of Cambridge, a graduate diploma in psychology, bachelor's of a Bachelor of Behavioural Science Honours Degree in Psychology and a PhD in Clinical Psychology. Today's episode, we're talking about body image and her research in that space. What's so interesting about this is that we look at body image and all the different types of invasive surgeries and, and, and different procedures um, and also non-invasive procedures, you know, Botox, fillers and the like. Nothing is skipped over. We talk vaginas, penises, breasts, lips bottoms you know and, and obviously the most important part of all of this is research in the area of you know body image in particular about some of those pressures for women in obviously the 21st century so listen up it's going to be a fantastic uh, episode to, to, to listen to and to really get a better appreciation about what body image looks like and, and their trends uh, at the moment also please if you enjoy this episode Please go and, and, and rate it, put in a you know, five-star please or go out and share it. The more listeners that we're able to, to have and, and grow, it means that we can get excellent guests and, and, and speakers on like Gemma. So enjoy. Thanks. Gemma, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Nash. It's great to be with you. Look, I really don't know where to start. There's there, there's so many things I'd like to uh, pick your brain on, particularly around, you know, body image and eating disorders. I know that you've done so much research, you know, uh, even, even you know, watching your uh, excellent TEDx talk on, you know, uh, how, how we view uh, labias or vulvas. Um, there's, there, there, there's um, you know, that, that, that space with trying to understand, you know, this modern understanding of vaginas and, and, and the like. So obviously, you know, you're not afraid of, of talking directly about all these topics, which is what excited me about, about talking about, you know, body image and, and, and um, you know, that whole, whole large space. So thanks for coming on and um, maybe I'll hand it over to you to, to start up. Sure, Nesh. I love how vaginas got into like the first one minute of this podcast. That is so <laughs> fantastic. I, uh, I'm always thrilled to hear that. And thank you for watching my TEDx talk. Um, yes, it's eight minutes of pure joy, I think, in my unbiased opinion. Um, yeah, so I, like, as you said, body image is such a broad area and I first started out in quite a niche area of genital body image, which is how, um, how that TEDx talk came about. And that's where I've spent, gosh, the last seven years of my uh, research life um, in, in the labiaplasty and genital body image space. I suppose just to define labiaplasty, just in case um, people don't know what that is, um, it's the surgical reduction of the inner vaginal lips or the labia minora. And um, the aim of that is to produce a sort of smooth genital surface. And the reason I even looked at that in the first place was back in 2013 when I started my PhD, um, it was a really fast growing surgery type. And I thought, why would women be getting surgery on a part of their body that so few people see, like compared to say a nose job or a boob job where the results are so visible. And that's, that's what inspired me to, to get into the genital body image field first. And in fact, labiaplasty is still the fastest growing cosmetic surgery type in the world. So it really hasn't slowed down. Um, and it's described as more than a passing trend now. I think people thought it might, um, might, might pass. 
Um, but no, it's it's continued year on year, and it's right up there with the Brazilian butt lift, um, which is um, basically like getting a a butt like Kim Kardashian. Um, so I'm proud to say that yeah, labiaplasty is <laughs> is up there with Brazilian butt lift, and I suppose um, in Australia as well. It is, yeah. Like the thing in Australia, unlike other some other countries, is that we uh, we don't require our private practitioners to report on their their numbers of procedures. Um, but we do know that Australians actually spend more per capita on cosmetic procedures than even people in the states. Whoa, that surprises me. I know we are. We love our cosmetic procedures here, which I suppose speaks to a broader body image issue in 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 our country and in in other countries. Um, it, it is quite baffling, isn't it? And you reacted exactly as I thought you would there, Nesh. Like everyone goes, "Oh yeah, the states they're leading the way," but really, we're spending more money on things um, like Botox, injectables all the way through to the more um, invasive procedures like labiaplasty, boob jobs, Brazilian butt lift, as I was saying before. So we're, we're covering the whole gamut. And the only difference is that uh, we just don't know our exact numbers, but they certainly do in the States. That's incredible. And what sort of numbers are we talking about? Well, I mean, gosh, in the States, like several hundred thousand procedures of all types performed each year. And I, I have no reason to think we're not that far behind. Um, and particularly what's been interesting in the last couple of years is the the, the uh, injectables or the non-invasive procedures becoming really popular. People just popping out in their lunch times to get a bit of Botox, a bit of filler. And um, not even, I mean, gosh, Unfortunately, it's quite an unregulated industry. So, so the person delivering the procedures might not be medically trained, uh, which is a real worry. Um, so we're sort of seeing these things pop up in beauty salons, not necessarily clinics anymore. So it's becoming really accessible, but also the risks are going up as a result of people who aren't necessarily correctly trained delivering these procedures. Now, what's going on with all of this? I mean, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're trained as a psychologist. You've done a you know, silly amount of research. Um, you, you. You, you, you're you're, you're you know, incredibly well published and like, what is going on? What, where, where's this come from? You know, is, yeah. is it an affluence thing? You know, is it we, we've got time, we've got money to burn. What, what are we doing? It's so all of the above, Nesh. Like, you're right. Like, um, cosmetic procedures used to be much more expensive in the past. So we, we have more disposable income now and the cost has come down. And also, I think um, cosmetic uh, surgeons and uh, cosmetic practitioners are very good at marketing um, their procedures so that people know about their existence. So they're on social media, they're um, sponsoring influencers on social media to undergo procedures and help them advertise. So there's that real, I suppose, media avenue, which we know, of course, also helps to um, show what the ideal appearance is for our society, which is, of course, very hard to obtain without um, uh, undergoing these risky procedures, unfortunately. So there's there's that real media influence, having the money, as well as just um, our interactions with our peers and family members too. Um, so if any of the listeners are familiar with that sociocultural model, I'm really tapping into that. Um, so we have a lot of appearance-based conversations with our friends and family. We don't even realise we're doing it. Like, you know, if you see someone you haven't seen for a while, you say, you look good. Like, you you, you don't even realise you're having these appearance conversations all the time. And it's just, I suppose, um, reinforcing that we value appearance um, in people uh, and we, we talk about it so easily and we tell people what they should and shouldn't like, but should and shouldn't look like both implicitly and explicitly. Even that's a really interesting space and please jump in and correct me where I completely go, sure. go wrong here. But I remember back at uni reading about studies that looked at, you know, male preferences versus female preferences in, in sort of uh, heterosexual um, uh, perspectives, um, yes. you know, looking at men, how they perceive women and how women perceive themselves. 
Yes. My understanding was that uh, uh, women thought that being thinner, uh, oh, sorry, women's perception was being thinner, um, well, what was more attractive than the, the, the men's perspective was a couple of sort of sizes larger than what the women's was. Like the, the, the experiment was kind of like showing all these body sizes that were generally going up and up and up into yes. size um, and the ones that the women were choosing, um, and I don't know percentage-wise how, how much of the difference was, but the women selected something thinner, a body size thinner than, than, than the men. First of all, my, my first question is, is, is that true? And secondly, is um, any research about like, you know, fillers for lips and those sorts of things you know are men going out and saying i love big lips like what 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 are we doing or is this more about how how the trend is of what is attractive that 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 um that that's kind of being um uh, there are certain areas that are being enhanced because of this notion of attractiveness is 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 moving in all sorts of different spaces previously it might be um, you know particular clothes or something and now we're moving into body parts yeah, that's, that's quite a, a triple-barreled question there, Nish. I'll try and cover it all. <laughs> um, uh, so, yes, I, I think um, your understanding of, of uh, that research is correct, that women will tend to, um, we tend to use these kind of body dissatisfaction scales where a woman will pick, like, where she feels uh, her body sits and then what she'd like her body to look like, and usually there's a big disparity between how she feels she looks and what she should look like and that's that's what we call body dissatisfaction and I have um, no doubt that women uh, would express to be much thinner than than their partners male peers would suggest they become um, so I agree it is I suppose it is a bit more about women policing their own bodies and um, we, we call that self-objectification theory, if anyone wants to um, have a look at that more, or objectification theory. So um, sort of seeing themselves as an object that must fulfill a certain ideal in order to be perfect and, and be accepted. Um, so that's, that, yeah, it, it's um, very startling and concerning research. Um, I suppose what I've seen recently uh, or more recently, we've had that thin ideal that was very much um, sort of 90s and 2000s, so being thick thin. I think Kate Moss, I think she said, nothing uh, tastes as good as skinny feels, um, which was a, that, yeah. an, extremely, an extremely damaging statement. Um, so we had those like stick thin runway models who really were our influencers back then. Now we've had a change. You've still got to be skinny but you've also got to look athletic too. So you've got to have that six pack abs or even more pack. I'm not even sure what we're up to now, eight pack, 10 pack, whatever. Um, so you've got to be sculpted. You've got to be lean, you've got to be tanned, but you still got to have the boobs and the booty. And I think that's, oh, wow. <laughs> how impossible is that? Like you're meant to be sculpted, but still have bigger boobs and a booty. So that's of course where the cosmetic industry can come in and go, hey, we can help you get that kind of physique. And this is really, I suppose the Kardashians epitomize this, um, this sort of tiny waist, but still womanly looking. And I just think, my gosh, these ideals are just getting harder and harder to, to fulfill in, in um, sort of ways that are not dangerous. So uh, it's, it, it, it's interesting trying to understand how the trend moves. That, that. It, it so is Nish and I like you talked about lip fillers there as well please um, forgive me if I've forgotten any of your points just bring me straight back um, again so uh, voluptuous lips is something that's been newer as well um, so uh, like um, again to use another Kardashian family member um, Kylie Jenner is really the queen of lips everyone wants to have Kylie Jenner's lips um, and Again, I'm not exactly sure how that came about. Um, I suppose potentially with um, taking selfies for social media, that kind of trout pout. Um, if people are watching this, they'll see me trying to do a trout pout. Um, and I think if you've got the bigger lips, well, then you've got a you've got a terrific trout pout going on. Um, but I mean, if we think about through history, Nesh, like these. These trends change so often. Like we had Marilyn Monroe in the 50s of a more 
voluptuous figure and then we go stick thin and now we're going back to something in between voluptuous and skinny it just it just changes all the time and um i mean i think something that i've found quite amusing but also sad is that um thin eyebrows used to be quite popular in the 2000s so we have a lot of women who plucked their eyebrows to be very very thin and now they're requiring eyebrow transplants to have the more bushy eyebrows that are popular in the 2020s so it's <laughs> like you're always yeah. having to change to to comply to the ideal i mean in some sense the what what i'm hearing is that these are trends like the the the, the big booty is a trend um and my apologies for listeners I, I think i called them fat lips rather than voluptuous lips i think i need to uh improve my improve <laughs> my um be like someone's punched you in the lip right but <laughs> just like that anyway um yeah just but these are trends that that will yeah <laughs> <laughs> These are trends that will last a period of time, though. This isn't like a 12-month trend. We, we, we're talking about this could be years, potentially even a Absolutely. decade, um, maybe even yeah. more. Um, sure, but we, we know sure. it's going to shift and move. But, but yes. in some sense, it, 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 it's also got a decent season, you know, like uh, boob, boob jobs at the moment, if we call them those. Um, you know, they, they've had a decent season to date you know and and it's a you know. very good point there nesh you're right like boobs have never really gone out of fashion boobs have always been something that's been a marker of femininity and, and beauty it would seem um and of course uh, cosmetic practitioners have been uh, honing their skills to make the results look i suppose more natural like that's what i'm hearing a lot of from the cosmetic practitioners like the boob jobs in the past they look like sort of rocks out the front um, and now they're now they're trying to make the the enhancement look more more natural um, and normal. So I I think I think the procedure remains the same, but the the technique shifts. It's interesting, even though the, the the language, you know, it's uh, and this is what's so fraught because you know you don't want to insult anyone, someone who has gone out and and had breast augmentation, you know, and the mm. like versus someone who hasn't. Uh, it's kind of hard to talk about it where we, you know, we, if we go and say it's an enhancement versus to say, well, um, no, it's a different look, um, you know, cause it, 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 it to go yeah, out right. and, you know, question it, It's no different to, I think in, in, in your TEDx talk also talking about, you know, designer vagina, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it, there's all these different terms that we use um that uh, as you say just happens in language it's kind of like oh you look good or oh, i love your eyebrows or something and it's it's effectively reinforcing we all know in psychology the reinforcement scheduling is, is is super important to get that from your loved ones is is the best you're, you're absolutely right nesh the language that is used in the cosmetic industry is so important for advertising like as you said there's design of vagina it's also vaginal rejuvenation so like meaning oh your old dusty vagina needs to be spiced up heaven rejuvenation forbid. Um, wow yeah so rejuvenation is used a lot i mean we also hear about mummy makeover like you know your body has gone to wreck and ruin because you've had a kid so you need a mummy makeover um, whereas I, um, I'm very keen to actually call these procedures exactly what they are, like breast augmentation, um, labiaplasty, because I think if we start calling them these kind of cute names, it really underplays how significant these procedures are mm -hmm. and the, mm. the risks that are involved. And I suppose something that I do in my clinical practice as well as my research, like I'm, I'm not opposed to people getting cosmetic procedures, but I am opposed to people who aren't good candidates or aren't psychologically suitable to getting them um, going forth with them. So I think um, I'm always keen to work with cosmetic practitioners to help them um, evaluate their their patients for suitability and i was actually very fortunate to work with the australian psychological society in 2018 to help them with their psychological assessment guidelines for people seeking cosmetic procedures so so do look them up folks if that's something you're interested in uh, because we give a lot of good information as to how how you might assess someone but i think um, from what i've heard from other psychologists in the area 
they're not necessarily getting the referrals from the cosmetic practitioners. So, so I think we probably need to do more about sort of building bridges between yeah. psychologists and cosmetic practitioners yeah. to make sure that, that, that these assessments are actually getting done. Like even it's not going to happen. It's not going to have a <laughs> it, it opposes this commercially. It, it, it opposes. I, I, I still have like, a dream. Man. Yeah. I have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Uh, yeah. Well, I, um, I think this is probably where, where I think something like the APS can advocate and go out and say, we need to make this as a mandated um, thing. Yeah. You know, because you, you mentioned it, I think, beautifully in, in, in my apologies, going back to the TEDx talk about, like, yeah. you know, we can't actually have properly, uh, and sort of taking from that talk, we can't have properly informed consents because someone who's going out and saying, I'm going to do a labiaplasty, as, as you mentioned, you know, a, a woman going through menopause later on in life, there's thinning of, of, of skin in those areas and oh. the like, and we don't know, um, I don't even know how we can go out and bloody put these medical things through without without doing these long longitudinal tests, you know, and, and examinations. You're but absolutely doing right, some crazy Mish. things yeah. without without knowing what That's, the consent is. We and and there's no way you can sort of stick the labia back on. And <laughs> that's although that that might come. Who knows? Um uh, but yes, I agree. We might like, do enhancements. Um, I know, like, lab- see, I actually think long labia are going to come back and my time to shine is going to come. Um, <laughs> we shall see. Maybe it's we'll have to come back. Of course it does. It always goes around, I, right? I hope so. And, and pubic hair will uh, make a comeback as well. I'm certain of that. Um, yay for pubic hair. Uh, so you're absolutely right, Nesh. Like, yeah, it's um, we don't have the long-term data I think for other procedures, for example, breast augmentation and things like that, that data is accumulating. Um, but for labiaplasty and the vaginal rejuvenation world, it's still more recent. So you're right, we don't have that long-term data. And menopause does change things down there. Um, and also, I think what I have seen is that uh, these women are less likely to choose to undergo a uh, vaginal childbirth because they don't want to, I suppose, muck up their procedure results. So they're more likely to undergo cesarean sections when they do have kids or if they choose to have kids, I should say. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of biasing them down towards um, cesarean as well. Um, so I think it will be very interesting to see when these women reach menopause, what, what actually does happen. And that's probably in the next 10 to 20 years. It's interesting. There's another whole place of when we think about body image, you know, how we're choosing to give birth uh, is, is is changing as well and not necessarily purely on medical grounds all the time. Uh, obviously, very important, um, you know, cesareans are often uh, uh, you know, uh, performed for, for very real you know, risk reduction reasons and the like. And then there's also um, many that aren't, you know, that, uh, and certainly not not being judgmental about people choosing, but the, the, the choice, yeah, part, the shift. Yeah, I agree. Like it is quite an interesting motivation, isn't it? Like I don't want to undo the work that I've done um, cosmetically speaking, uh, but I still want to bring my child into the world. And I think, I suppose as long as, um, I suppose we get back to that informed consent, don't we, Nesh? Like sort of, you know, you're having this procedure. If you choose to have children, these are the things you need to think about before you undergo this procedure. Like say if you always wanted to have a natural childbirth, but you still, uh, I should say vaginal childbirth, um, but you want to have a labiaplasty as well, you might want to think about that. So I think these are things that really need to be discussed more at the outset. Is this part of the great challenge that we have is that sometimes we want both and they're competing demands. They, 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 they're, they're opposing each other. Oh gosh, yes. I think that um, is very much the case in so much of life. But I think particularly in the this sort of beauty industry, like um, people will say they, they feel uncomfortable. Um, I suppose they may consider themselves to have some femi- feminist ideals, but they also want to comply to or conform to the beauty ideals as well. And it's like, well, how do I do that? Like without sort of having that conflict of thought, just as you were saying. Just the thought that popped into my head, it's, it's kind of interesting in, in this space um, uh, 
thinking about the male side, you know, uh, there's, yes, there's um, yes. obviously circumcisions have been around for, for forever and a day is my they understanding have, yes. as well. Um, uh, that's not, that hasn't really been considered like plastic surgery. Um, uh, but maybe it is, yes. I don't know. Uh, how, how, where does that fit in? It's such a good question, Nash, and I'm excited to say that I also do work on penile augmentation. I never like to leave the boys out of it. Um, <laughs> the circumcision stuff is so interesting. I, I need to read up more on it myself. Um, I believe, I mean, I believe it was sort of far more popular in like the, the 60s, 70s, um, and now is not so routinely done. I... I mean, I'd be happy for the listeners to, to jump in on this. Um, like sort of the, there was a lot of thoughts around it being more hygienic um, and, and things like that. And so there were sort of multiple reasons as well as cultural reasons too um, impacting it. Um, I know, I think um, for some of the penile augmentation research I've done, and that's to do with girth augmentation, so a bit different, um, but I think men were choosing, to, so at least some of them, were choosing to have a circumcision done at the same time. And I think it's probably potentially like a penile rejuvenation or something like that. Um, mm. But I know, like, with the, the injection of the filler to make the, um, the, penile, the penile girth larger, it would actually make the foreskin droop. I'm a, I'm, apologies for these images that are all running through your head right now. Um, so with more filler, the foreskin drooped. And so the surgeon... Is that, is that what pretty, it is that they, they put filler to get... Yeah, like the same filler to your face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and so um, it would make the foreskin droop and then the person would end up getting a, a circumcision done because they didn't want the, the drooping the skin droop. because it was just so much heavier. Yes. Um, so that was quite interesting in that study. Um, I, I suppose what I have been seeing with the, the sort of the male reasons or the female reasons, they're not all that different. Like I think some people might think, oh, men would get these get procedures done for vastly different reasons, but it's simply not the case. They have the same kinds of influences as uh, women and everyone in between do. And about 10% of cosmetic procedures are performed on men. So it's still, it's a minority, but it's not, you know, 10. it's not negligible either, 10%. See, that surprises me as well. And I'm not, not, not suggesting that uh, 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 men wouldn't, but I wouldn't have thought um that it's at, uh, at at that rate, and what? How do we how do we define procedures? Like what 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 is that sort of what what are the categories or the things that you you put into that? Um, yeah, bucket? absolutely. So, um, uh, like I I use procedure in a really broad sense. So it can be the non invasive stuff of fillers, Botox, all the way through to um, uh, with men. They'll often um, you've heard of man boobs, Nesh, or moobs. Um, so they will, they will get like a sort of a, a chest re-sculpting. Um, men will also get things like flat, uh, facelifts and I suppose things that make their torso more defined are, are most common for men. Yeah, wow. And do we know numbers of men, men um, using fillers and those sorts of things? That's, it's a great question, Nish. I think I would have to look that up, my apologies. Um, but if the listeners are keen, there's a fantastic website um, the aesthetic surgery of, a, I think it's ASAPS is the A-S-A-P-S is the acronym and it's all the American stats. They do a great job of keeping the stats and they do break it down by gender and what's popular with men, what's popular with women, invasive and non-invasive procedures. So it breaks it down really nicely. Now and I have to ask. 2019 results. So yay, 2019, hopefully coming soon. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I have to ask about uh, you know re research that's looked into, and I, I believe you've done so as well um, about people's satisfaction post uh, procedure. Yeah. Um, can you talk yes. about about that? You know, we the idea obviously is I'm not happy with you know my you know eyebrows. I go out, I get my eyebrows done, um, and then I I, I go out and. Uh, complete some sort of questionnaire or, or some sort of study looks at how pleased I am with my eyebrows. What's it like with, you know, all these procedures, whether it's, you know, injectables or, you know, whether it's, um, you know, more invasive type, type of uh, procedures. 
Yeah, such a good question, Nesh, and it's such a, a nuanced answer as well. We tend to find that with the, the non-invasive procedures, so the injectables, fillers, Botox, the satisfaction rates are, tend to be a little bit lower simply because the effects don't last. So people always want something that will be a permanent solution. Um, but the fact that they have to go back in every sort of six to 18 months to, to get it redone tends to, to lower their satisfaction a bit. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not that they're dissatisfied, but it's just that a permanent solution would be better. In terms of the invasive procedures, again, people tend to be relatively satisfied unless they've experienced complications, uh, which can and do occur, um, some procedures more than others, um, and that tends to really lower satisfaction quite a bit. I found from my own research that it's generally... The biggest issue is people going in with unrealistic expectations. So thinking that having a procedure will get them a new job, get them a new partner, revolutionise their life. That's where people are dissatisfied because they, they've just gone in completely unrealistically. And, and I think um, I'm always encouraging cosmetic practitioners to have that discussion about expectations and, and to check that they are realistic. I wonder if there's any connection and, and maybe just want to sort of uh, toss the ball around a little bit with the less invasive injectable type, you know, they're, yes. they're, they're obviously a lot more, they're, they're a lot cheaper. Um, yes. There's a lower satisfaction generally um, yes. versus invasive, which often means um, you can't, return um the yeah the, you might the, have the to have a week procedure. several weeks off work yeah, yeah. They're, they're, so they're kind of like more permanent and and they're certainly more expensive i wonder yeah. whether our investment changes it whether if uh, uh, if someone <laughs> yes. had to pay you know eight hundred dollars for a um you know lunchtime botox session um that all of a sudden we might find someone saying, oh, I'm really happy with it because you kind of have to run a narrative or some sort of story to say, I'm happy because I spent good money on it. You've hit the nail on the head, Nish, and I write this in every single paper I, I publish. Um, there's that real cognitive dissonance of like, you know, I've, I've been through this pain, I've paid this money, I've had to take time off work, it's been uncomfortable, I have to like the outcome. And I think that is um, something I'm very aware of. And I tend to make sure, particularly when I'm running follow-up studies, I never like to go below six months post-procedure because that kind of cognitive dissonance bubble is really at play before then. Um, usually the further you are away from the procedure, the, the less they remember the cost, the pain, the time out of work. And they can tend to be a little bit more realistic about, um, about their outcomes. And I think what happens with cosmetic practitioners is they see them sort of three months afterwards when they're still like, I love it. It's the best thing ever. And so I think that might give an inflated sense of satisfaction because they're seeing them so close afterwards because they have to. They need to medically check them. But if they saw them in 12 months, I wonder if it might be a different response. Yeah, wow. Well. Wow, um, I didn't realise that. Uh, my apologies. I should have, I should have uh, read more of your studies, but um, <laughs> no, uh, no, Nesh, you, you watched my TEDx talk. That's more than enough. <laughs> um, it's, <laughs> but it's um, it's it is a big deal in the I suppose cosmetic outcome research field that we just go if you're below six months, how how much can we really take from these results? Um, and also the like. I suppose the procedure might be still settling down. It might still be swollen and things like that. So I think they might not even have their final aesthetic outcome even. So mm. how can they really judge satisfaction so quickly? Yeah, because we, especially the, an investment that's going to be for an extended period of time, you you kind of have to learn to love it as well. You know, if, if, if you've spent a lot of money on a vehicle or something, you kind of have to go out six months later and say, yeah, I love it. I still love it. You know, even yeah, if it exactly. might have been, you know, it's a little bit smaller than you actually anticipated it would be in terms yeah. of, you know, having a whole family in there. You kind of, you know, spruik it up. You say, it's really good. You know, it drives well. <laughs> yeah, you get your fluffy dice. You love it. Um, <laughs> and that's, like, it's a really good point you touched on there, Nesh. Like, I suppose... If people don't love it and then they're like, I need another surgery to fix what was done. And then we start getting into this really slippery slope of 
cosmetic surgery addiction, uh, cosmetics being called a cosmetic surgery junkie, um, people who just like they see they fix one thing or and the focus shifts to another area that they think is problematic or it stays on the same area and we're really getting into that I suppose body dysmorphic dysarea zone um, which we know is um, is a, a, a cosmetic procedure should not be performed on people with body dysmorphic disorder it's a real red flag because we know that they tend to not improve or get worse um, and can also, they're more likely to sue their practitioners and also unfortunately um, um, uh, potentially harm themselves or the practitioner. And there's certainly been cases of cosmetic surgeons unfortunately being murdered uh, in the States because someone has been so unhappy with their outcomes and it's later been revealed that they had body dysmorphic disorder before they had the procedure done. So that is something we're always very mindful of. I think it's the biggest red flag that that we all look out for and and the cosmetic practitioners themselves know about it too so i think it is it is fairly well known but i think in terms of actually looking for it and knowing what to, knowing what to knowing what to look for is not well done um and i think that's all that's why we need psychologists mm. that's why we need um, good, uh, really good rating scales, clinical interviews to make sure we pick up on the people who shouldn't be having these procedures done. And maybe that's the area where psychologists could could really uh, assist with, um, uh, you know, the the medical practitioners that are looking to perform these, where where we, they realise that this is about minimising risk. Because what you're talking about is really an obsessive and severe dissatisfaction meaning that exactly. you know if you're dissatisfied with your with your nose you get a, a nose job or rhinoplasty and then all of a sudden you're still dissatisfied you know the, the lump yeah. there is a little bit higher than i expected so you go back and do another one and you can probably yeah. never get it right because it's kind of like obsessive compulsive disorder you can never actually meet that feeling that 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 that, that um, you know emotional rest that you're looking for you're trying to remove the tension by getting surgery exactly nesh and that's that's always the issue with body dysmorphic disorder that people will seek out a physical solution in the form of surgery rather than a psychological solution because they truly believe that there is a problem with their nose for example so why would they go see a psychologist about their nose they'll go see a surgeon because the surgeon can fix the nose and so that's where as you were saying the surgeon and psychologist really need to work together because this person may sue the surgeon they may harm themselves or the surgeon and so I, as you were saying um when i'm talking to cosmetic practitioners i i'm like do you want to be sued do you want to be killed um then listen to this and they tend to they tend to listen to that kind of narrative it's also really interesting that there are certain things that we're kind of more okay with than than, than others like we yes. might go out and you know, i think a lot of people these days um, and I, my apologies because I won't get the term right here as well. Um, they will, I was going to say bleach, but uh, now that I've said it, it's there, but they'll whiten their teeth. Um, yes. uh, that, that's a common one. You can probably, see, one. You can probably um, see it on my teeth. <laughs> uh, everything's whitened on a, on a, uh, on a screen. But uh, you know, that, that's a common one. And, and I don't yes. think people kind of balk at that. You know, we, we, we don't go, oh, my goodness. You know, maybe if someone's teeth are just like super bright white, you know, but yeah. once that's again, even that's a trend. Like the, um, do you go super bright or do you go mild white? You know, it's, it's fascinating. Totally. We call it like the Shane Warne toilet bowl effect, um, like where you're <laughs> just you're so white. It's, and like, the, <laughs> I, I agree. Like, you know, it's, we never, we never sort of um, look twice at a child who's having braces and, like, clearly oh. that has a lot of cosmetic influence, doesn't it, that they want straight teeth and we don't, we don't tend to judge them. So you're right. We, there is a sliding scale. There's, like, you know, um, teeth work. Breast augmentation has become more acceptable as we've gone on. We do have, like, labiaplasty at the extreme end where we're like, no, no, you can't do that. So I agree, we, we have become more comfortable with things over time. Just going back to the teeth example, I think, um, I know certainly, 
I think practitioners could become concerned if someone is coming back so often to get it done um, because it is it is actually damaging to the teeth. Um, so I think there there is definitely a discussion to be had of you know you want really really white teeth but you're actually going to damage them in the process by having them that white. And and certainly we do see body dysmorphic disorder focused on teeth and, and skin all the time. Can I ask a personal question? Sure. How, how do you, obviously as a psychologist and a researcher, uh, uh, how do you, let, let, let's say with the, you know, and, you know, air quotes, minor procedure um, of uh, teeth whitening, um, how do you reconcile that? You know, how do you go out and, 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 and how does it fit in your head? Just, just interesting to, to, to appreciate and understand. Yeah, like for myself or for yeah, other people? for yourself, for yourself. <laughs> yes, I, people think, what a hypocrite. Um, I, yeah, gosh, I think... We all do um, things, right? I mean, yeah, we, we do course, our hair. You know, everyone says, yeah, it's okay to do your hair. You go out and you, you know, give it, give it a different colour and I'll shave my head. You know, yeah. there's still a style that we're all doing and, you know... Uh, I, I agree. And like I said, I'm actually not against... Um, people getting cosmetic procedures and that includes myself although I haven't had any done because um, I think it's all about um, sort of motivations and realistic expectations and like when I got my teeth whitened I wasn't like I'm going to be like a star psychologist um, I'm going to get given the Nobel Prize like I, <laughs> nothing like that um, it was actually just that I was doing a lot of media work and having to watch myself back um, which was great fun. Um, so I was like, oh, well, you know what? My dentist mentioned it to me. I'll give it a go. And, like, I I get touch-ups irregular, irregularly. I can't even say the word. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, it's not, not in a problematic area. And like I said, I'm not, not against people getting stuff done, changing their hair, all that kind of stuff. It's all just around the, the motivations. That's what's fascinating about all of this is how do we sit with it in you know, this grey space, you know, about what are my motivations, you know, what, what are people's motivations? You know, is this whole space, you know, this is body image that we're talking about, you know, yes. is it that most people are dissatisfied? You know, I mean, what, what, what number of the population, you know, goes out and completes these, these self-reports and says, you know what, I'm kind of happy with my, you know, little tummy that's starting to stick out and, you know, I'm not too, too fussed about my arms. You know, I'm, I like my arms, you know, they, you know, help me do, do life, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, we, we, what's the sort of percentage of sort of dissatisfaction and, and, you know, maybe even, you know, is it mild? Is it severe? How, how do we, how do we gauge all of that? Do you have an idea population wise? That's, I think, from the work I've been doing most recently, Nesh, which has been with young people, because that's when the, the body image concern starts. So I'll speak, I'll speak to them first. And our latest Mission Australia com uh, survey coming out of Australia um, showed that uh, over 30% of young people were either very or extremely concerned about their body image. So that's real high-end stuff. And more than 30% that's that's a problem really isn't it and it, and it's typically year on year ranked as one of their um highest concerns in life so up there with like study mental health their future body image is up there so it's not something down on the list and although i think we need to do more research across the lifespan we know that people don't necessarily grow out of these concerns like people think oh, i'll grow into my body that's I know that from my clients. They just go, I thought I would, but I haven't. Um, potentially it slips down the list maybe of highest ranked concerns as we get older, but it's still there. And I, like, I certainly think we should be doing more to help people with body image concerns across the lifespan and not just that sort of teenage 20s area because that's simply, that's, they're not the only people. It's men, women, young, old and everything in between. Yeah, well, and, and, and clearly we know this is the case because, it, you know, we, we see the surgeries occurring when people start having money and they go, I, I can go exactly. out and start spending it on myself. So yeah. They've been concerned for like 10, 20 years prior to that. It's only when they have the finances and the means uh, to actually do these procedures they do, and I see this all the time, and it's just 
Like I don't want people to be dissatisfied with themselves for decades and then have to wait for a surgical solution, which may not even make them happier. Like I, I think that's awful. And I, mm. I suppose my research is all about intervening earlier and what we can do to help people without having to have surgery. And although that is an option, it's not the only option. It's also interesting because if one of my daughters and they're very, very little, so we're not, we're not there, yet, there yet, but in my mind, I'm like, yep, we're going to go do, do the braces option. Uh, you know, um, yes. we'll start putting some money away, et cetera, et cetera. And this well, is what we're doing. But uh, I know, you know, well ahead of time, if one of my daughters say, Hey dad, you know, I'm thinking about a butt lift. You know, it's like, you know, you already know the answer. Why are you asking me? You know, uh, it's kind of like, we're going to allow it for this. We're not going to allow it for that. And I'm sure everyone has their own thresholds and, sure. and, and, and the like, but it, it's a lifespan thing. It's not just a little sort of person or a young person. Um, certainly not little cause they don't think about it that way. Um, uh, but they have a young, a young person. Um, although in actual fact, uh, my, my daughter recently, we got, got some dental work done and, and um, uh, she had a cap uh, put on her tooth and, you know, we're very sort of conscious of saying it's a sparkly tooth, you know, because uh, it's a, of a, of a um, metallic colour. Um, yeah. And, you know, and she, she's asking great questions like, Dad, does the uh, tooth fairy give you more money for a sparkly tooth? <laughs> I love it. She's an entrepreneur. <laughs> but <laughs> she's a little bit, my research. I, I think there might even be a little bit of self consciousness there, a little bit, and she's six. Um, so obviously, okay, at that age, you know, she might, and I don't know whether that's the case or not, but it, it seems yeah. to me like she's a little bit cognizant of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm different. My, my, my two, I, I used to have a white yeah. one, and now it's different. There's, you're hitting the nail there on the head there, Nish. Like, we actually know that kids before they even reach primary school, have a sense of their own body and even a okay. sense of like the ideal. So it, it's scarily young um, and, yes, it is a problem. Like you can interview three-year-olds, four-year-olds about um, the word fat and they'll know that being fat is not an ideal and it's a, a bad thing to be and it ostracizes you from your group so I, I know it starts really really young and the fact that she is noticing that she um, she has some different teeth from uh, her peers is is very normal and I think um, I tend to sort of talk about uh, what your body does for you rather than what it looks like. So I wonder yeah, if nice. her sparkly, sparkly tooth might actually help her eat food more easily or like it might even be like a superpower tooth. Um, so I feel like there are things we can do around this that we, I suppose, yeah, I'm all about what your body does for you and we don't even say thank you rather than what it looks like. Sure. Now, obviously, you know, uh, if, if children are talking about this, you know, even from the age of three, um, I yeah. think it's fairly clear to go out and, and, and confidently um, to, to, to say this stuff starts at home, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's about, about role modelling um, the kind of conversations we have. Uh, like, you know, if you're on a diet, maybe don't be discussing that with your, with your young kids. Um, or even in them, them being in the room while you're talking about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're so right, Nish. Like, uh, yeah, these are not conversations that young people uh, should be hearing about. The appearance talk, and I suppose it is a natural part of life, but it's also about talking about all of our positive attributes, um, talk, talking about ourselves as whole people, um, not just an outer shell. And I, I think um, parents and carers have such a tough job, but I think if you start um, making these small shifts, um, can really have huge benefits for your children. Is there a particular sort of language? Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned kind of making, you know, like a, a superpower type of scenario. What's the sort of language that we can kind of help with to, to, to give um, listeners some, some ideas? This is a very good point, Nish, and I think um, <laughs> I think there's no right answer there. I know there's a great program. Um, I think it's um, Confident Body, conf no, Confident Mum, Confident Body. Uh, it's by uh, um, Zali Yeager. She's done a great job there. Big shout out to Zali, uh, which I think gives some really good tips about how parents can do good role modelling. I'm also um, building something at the moment. It's meant for... Um, 
for kids age 13 plus. I know it's a bit older, but there's also a parent carer section, um, which I think would be really good for these conversations, even with younger kids. And uh, it's our collaboration with the Butterfly Foundation. Uh, it's called our Body Image Chatbot. So it actually talks to you, how exciting. Um, and we'll be launching that later this year. So I hope that lots of people will use that. We're gonna be launching it on Instagram. Again, very exciting to have that collaboration. Too. And what, what does that do? What, 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 what's that program do? Yeah, so it, it basically talks about what body image concerns are, um, how prevalent, what the consequences can be like body image disorders, like eating disorders, but also um, tips for talking with young people. If you're concerned, what to look out for, um, being a positive uh, role model for young people too. Um, it, anything that uh, tickles your fancy, hopefully it'll be in the chat box. Make sure when it comes out, you give me a shout out and I'll, I'll share it with all, all the listeners and the like so that everyone can, oh, can, can thank, go there thank you, and, and pick it up. Yeah. We're actually still looking for um, young people aged 13 to 18, as well as their parents, carers, for our focus groups to give us um, feedback on the bot. So they're welcome to contact me at uh, gemma.sharp at monash.edu if they're keen on uh, being involved in our focus groups because we want to make sure our bot is as good as possible before we let it out into the World Wide Web. And is that the same email that people could, 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 could contact with if they want to collaborate or maybe do some work together? Maybe oh, you could please, ju please just repeat, re repeat the email again. No worries. It's gemma.sharp at monash.edu or you could just Google my name, Gemma Sharp and Monash. You'll, you'll find me always looking for um, great PhD students to join my body image research group, collaborators always wonderful to hear from you we we do have some really cool techie type projects coming out because we know that um actually having these resources available in the palm of your hand on your phone is going to be really helpful for people fantastic thank you for your amazing work your yeah, and, and, and time it's so important that that we keep producing you know research that goes out and guides you know uh, clinicians like myself as well so that we we can be better um you know, tooled up as well to not only help our clients, but also raise our own children and, and the like and, and reflect on ourselves and say, you know, how do I personally, you know, uh, uh, relate to my own body? Um, so thank, thank you uh, again for coming on the show and really look forward to maybe, maybe I can uh, sneakily get you back again at some point. Uh, I would love to come back, Nesh, and I can't wait to introduce you to my chatbot character. Um, <laughs> make sure that he, she, it is on the line as well. So, yeah, can't wait. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks to the listeners for, for tuning in. Thanks, Gemma. Take care. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe. Share it via social media. And tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.